we're going to dive into the incredible world of the katana, the most iconic sword on the planet. You've probably seen it in action in games and movies like Cyberpunk or Kill Bill. But as often happens in the magical realm of cinema, directors tend to sprinkle a little extra pixie dust on objects to make them appear way more awesome than they are. So today, let's debunk some of the most popular myths and legends surrounding the katana. After this, you'll know where the smoke and mirrors are and we'll figure out just how much its powers differ in the digital realm versus the real world. Now, let's set our time-traveling machines back to the 15th century to uncover the birth of this legendary blade. The katana's family tree includes ancestors like Tai Chi, which came onto the scene much earlier. They evolved over time, sort of like your favorite superhero, until they transformed into the mighty katana we know today. But if we dig even deeper, we can trace the katana's roots all the way back to the 5th century AD. That's when the Japanese borrowed some sword wisdom from the Chinese, and over many centuries, they brewed up the world-famous katana. So, for today's adventure, we'll stop our time traveling at the 15th century and learn the secrets of its creation. Let's begin with the birth of the katana blade itself, the shining star of the show. Everything else, like the hilt, guard and scabbard, followed in its glimmering footsteps. Creating this epic blade wasn't child's play, no sir. Ancient Japanese masters weren't in a hurry, they took their sweet time crafting just one. We're not talking about your run-of-the-mill blacksmiths here, who had to churn out swords for a whole army, we're talking about the Da Vinci's of swordsmithing. True fanatics who honed their skills over generations, creating blades that survived the test of time. Now, as for making a katana, the secret source was in stacking up many layers of steel. The steel itself was treated like a gourmet dish, refined through a process that involved layering multiple metal sheets. In popular folklore, many layers meant a better blade, like icing on a cake. But in reality, the kitchen was hotter than it looked. When they pushed it to the limit, the blade lost all the advantages of this special technique. Here's a little historical twist for you. Did you know that Europeans were already hip to the metal layering game back in the 3rd century BC? Yep, while the Japanese were rocking bows and crafting the katana in the 14th century, Europe had already jumped on the let's invent firearms bandwagon. Talk about some seriously mixed levels of progress in those days. Now let's return to our awesome blade. Before we can start forging it, we need to cook up a special steel concoction called tamahagane. It's like culinary art for blacksmiths. Picture this, iron-rich sand melting away in a special furnace over several days. And when it's all hot and bothered, they literally break the furnace apart and send the molten metal to the blacksmith. The blacksmith, being the artist that they are, handpicks the best bits and gives them a good old hammer makeover to shape them just right. Then, after a cool-down session, the blacksmith goes shopping again, handpicking the cream of the crop. These chosen pieces get stacked together, slathered in a clay and ash mix, and sent back to the furnace for a little quality time. Why, you ask? To let the slag, that is all the impurities, separate from the steel, and they kinda hang out in the clay and ash mix. The end result? A hammered hot mess of metal where all the individual pieces cozy up. During the forging process, any lingering impurities get the boot. The finished product is 50% lighter than the raw metal, which is like hitting the gym for steel. This fused hunk of metal gets hammered and folded multiple times for a little steel mingling party. It's like the katana's own version of a blending session. They mix the iron and steel to make it all uniform. This magic dance results in about 5,000 layers per one centimeter of steel. Now, let's talk about metal fusion. In case you didn't know, the katana is a fusion superhero with two types of steel. The outer tough guy, Tamahagane, and the inner softy. Thanks to this awesome duo, the katana isn't just tough, it's flexible too. During the fusion process, which is like a metal tango lasting several days, the block gets stretched and they arrange strips of varying hardness, creating the katana's unique structure and initial shape. Then it's time for the katana to get a spa treatment with a layer of liquid clay. It's like the sword's version of a face mask. This helps keep it from overheating and oxidizing when it gets the full heat treatment. 
During this fiery quenching process, a pattern forms between the hard, sharp part and the more flexible side. It's like the katana's signature tattoo, and it really shows off its creator's skills. So there you have it, the epic journey of forging a katana. Now, brace yourself for the next step, the quenching process, which is like giving the katana a spa day with a hot twist. This is where the sword is heated to a temperature that's precisely tailored to the type of metal being used, and then it gets a rapid cooldown treatment. It's like a hot and cold spa session, but for swords. As a result, the cutting edge gains an extraordinary level of hardness, making it even more formidable. After this, the katana enters a meticulous makeover phase to achieve its final form, sharpness, and a sparkling polish that's smoother than a dance floor. But hold on, we've just scratched the surface. We've got the hilt, guard, and scabbard to delve into, and these are masterpieces in their own right. It's like assembling a dream team of artisans because, let's face it, no one can be the best at everything. So let's break it down. The hilt is typically crafted from wood, then dressed up with stylish stingray skin and bound together with elegant silk ribbon or thread. The magic touch? A trusty bamboo peg holds everything in place. It might sound unconventional, but trust me, it's rock solid reliable. Next up, the guard, or should we say the sword's personal bodyguard. It's got a double duty job. It prevents your hands from slipping onto the blade during intense thrusting moves and makes sure your fingers don't become an enemy's quick snack. It's like a shield in disguise. And then there's the little collar-like piece on the blade called the habaki. It's the katana's version of a stay-put device, ensuring it doesn't decide to take any unscheduled vacations from its scabbard. Some master craftsmen even get creative and add patterns to it, known as cat scratches, to make sure the blade is snug in its scabbard and add that personal touch. Now here's the plot twist in the epic katana saga. Contrary to the widespread misconception that samurai strolled around in kimonos with a single katana, it wasn't their go-to weapon. In reality, samurai were decked out in heavy armor and had a thing for horseback riding, as their armor weighed a whopping 25 kilograms or around 55 pounds. Their weapon of choice? The bow. Yes, that's right, the katana was more like their trusty sidekick for self-defense. But wait, there's more. In addition to the katana, they had a shorter blade called the wakizashi, which measured around 70 to 80 centimeters or around 2.5 feet. By the way, the katana itself came in at 90 to 100 centimeters, so the size gap isn't all that colossal. The wakizashi came in handy in tight spots or for the final flourish when the chips were down. Unlike the katana, samurai practically had their wakizashi by their side 24-7 for self-defense. Both these blades hung on the left side for easy right-handed access because in Japan, being a lefty was a big no-no. It was strictly off-limits. This is why all these blades were tailor-made for right-handed warriors. And if you think that's all, there's more to the wakizashi story. It boasted a handy cord called Sageo. Samurai could use the cord to tie up their opponent's hands and stage a successful capture. Now, when it came to real combat with the katana, it was pretty straightforward. Either you wielded it with both hands and thrust at your opponent, especially when they were armored because, let's face it, slashing armor doesn't make a dent, or after a dramatic crossing of blades, you'd wrench the sword away from your adversary, trip them to the ground, and wrap things up with a dazzling finish using the wakizashi. The Sageo cord could also come into play. You could use it to tie up your opponent because, as I mentioned earlier, slashing through armor was futile and could be a blade breaker. Forget those movie scenes where two masters cross blades, share a dramatic eye look, and somersault 20 meters apart. In reality, you couldn't even hop a couple of meters in that heavy armor. If you tried, you'd most likely trip, fall, and become an easy target for impalement. So, the cinematic scenes? Pure spectacle, my friends. By the way, here's a quirky tidbit for you. Katana blades come with tangs that are like the unsung heroes of the sword world. These tangs have been traditionally wedged into the hilt with trusty bamboo pegs. And guess what? They've never been given a spa day ever. And you know what's even cooler? They're still not getting any TLC today. 
That's because Japan has this association, kind of like the sword detectives, and they use the rust on these tangs to play detective and figure out how old the blade is. It's like giving your sword a fingerprint, and if you decide to give it a good old cleaning, well, the sword's value will plummet faster than a rock in a pond, by at least half. Alright, let's roll up our sleeves and dive headfirst into the wild and wacky world of katana myths. It's time to separate fact from fiction in the realm of games and movies. First up, we've got the big kahuna myth about the katana's origin story. Many folks out there think the katana is some kind of mythical marvel, the holy grail of blacksmithing. But guess what? It's just another blade in the crowd. Archaeologists have dug up Celtic swords dating back to the 5th century BCE, which, by the way, is almost a thousand years older than those fancy katanas. These ancient swords were made by intentionally welding different types of steel together, just like some kind of ancient steel jigsaw puzzle. And let's not forget about gladi swords. They were rocking a Rockwell hardness of up to 60, which for all you blade connoisseurs is prime real estate for top-notch sword making. So European swords and knives were strutting their stuff on the catwalk of quality since the Roman Empire days. As I mentioned before, while the Japanese were still chasing butterflies with their swords, the Europeans had already moved on to playing with firearms. Now, here comes the next myth, a real showstopper. The samurai taking on bullets with their trusty katanas. You've probably seen this in movies, our fearless hero swings their katana like it's no big deal and somehow bullets magically veer away. But let's break it down. Bullets are like speedsters in the air and they pack a punch in the kinetic energy department. First of all, ain't nobody got reflexes quick enough to pull off such a stunt. When you hear that gunshot, the bullets already thrown the party and moved on. Like a ninja in the night. No chance to bat it away, my friend. And as for the kinetic energy, picture this. Take a metal rod, give it to a buddy, and have them whack it as hard as they can with another rod. Boom! That's what a bullet colliding with a sword feels like, and it's not a tea party. Even if the hardness of the katana matches the bullet's hardness, it'll do a limbo dance, not a deflection. So, all these movie scenes are pure make-believe and about as realistic as unicorns in your backyard. And now for the final myth, where someone sliced the person into multiple parts with a katana, which is physically impossible, then within a couple of seconds sheathed it, and only upon the blade's full return to its scabbard, the person's body conveniently fell apart into many pieces. This myth is a fusion of several falsehoods. First, there's the part where someone sliced another into several pieces in a couple of quick strikes, and then the notion that the body breaks apart a few seconds later. To give you an idea of how challenging it is to slice human flesh, complete with bones into multiple parts with just a few strikes, try buying a chicken, sharpening a regular knife, not one designed for bone chopping, and attempt to slice it into three parts with just three strikes. I can guarantee you that you'll find it nearly impossible, primarily because cutting through bone, especially human bone, is exceedingly difficult, and pulling off such a stunt in the heat of battle is just implausible. As for the second part of the myth, where the body falls apart into pieces after a certain amount of time, take any object, a knife, and attempt to cut it at least three parts in such a way that they only slide apart after a couple of seconds. In movies, it's depicted as if the enemy was sliced apart so rapidly that the person remained alive for a few seconds, watching their body disintegrate. In reality, many of these myths defy the laws of physics and couldn't have occurred in real life. As I mentioned earlier, the katana was used as a piercing weapon designed to target unprotected areas and inflict damage. The katana is a weapon with centuries-old traditions and a rich history deserving of respect. However, to claim it as the ultimate sword would be a stretch. In movies and games, we've grown accustomed to seeing it as the pinnacle of lethal weaponry capable of taking on pistols and rifles when wielded with mastery. But in practice, it turns out to be a secondary weapon, used not for slicing enemies, but for piercing unprotected spots. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. There's more fascinating content coming your way.